The fate exam is a term that has been coined in the last decade to describe the bedside point of care ultrasound that many ICU and emergency physicians have been performing for years and most will need to know how to do in the future. This is quickly becoming the future of medical diagnosis and will become the standard of care. In fact, a handful of uh, medical schools are putting ultrasound education into the four-year medical student curriculum, including UC Irvine, and many institutions have identified bedside ultrasound as one of the top 25 skills that they expect their residents to know prior to graduation. The FATE protocol is not intended to replace the formal transthoracic echo, but rather to be used as an adjunct to the bedside physician's physical exam so that we can better understand and manage our patient's hemodynamics in real time. As a background, uh, there's an article from 2004 that describes a group of anesthesiologists in Europe who trained their intensivist in bedside cardiac ultrasound, focused cardiac ultrasound, and then watched to see how their implementation of this uh, technology changed the management of their patients. What they found was that following the FATE protocol, the focused assessed transthoracic echo provided usable images that contributed to evaluation in 97% of patients. About a third of these echoes revealed new information that wasn't previously suspected, but aided in the understanding of the patient. In about a quarter of the cases, the imaging was decisive in evaluation. The goals of the FATE evaluation are several. Number one, we want to exclude obvious pathology, and these include such things as pericardial effusions, uh, valvular failure, uh, mechanical devices, and so forth. Next, we look at uh, static dimensions of the heart, including wall thickness and chamber dimensions. And at the same time, we notice contractility of the left ventricle and the right ventricle. We image the pleura bilaterally because thoracic um, anatomy and thoracic pathology can certainly interplay with cardiac function. But the most important step is to relate the findings to the clinical context of the patient. The FATE exam has several key acoustic windows that we will go over today. This is a how-to type of discussion about how to obtain the images and what uh, we are looking at on the screen. The first place that we will evaluate the heart is sub subcostally. Some people call this subxiphoid. Um, it can be subxiphoid, but in general, we are to the right of midline and looking underneath the lip underneath the rib through the liver into the heart. So many people call it the subcostal view. We have an apical view and a parasternal view. And again, we look at the pleura bilaterally. First, we'll focus on the subcostal view. This is one of the most useful views for a number of our patients, one of the easiest to train, and also the one where we can evaluate IVC volume status. So there's an indicator on each probe that helps you with orientation. In this orientation, in this view, we indicator is towards the patient's right. And from underneath the diaphragm, we look through the diaphragm up into the thorax and view the heart in several different cuts. This is an overhand grip with the probe somewhat parallel to the bed with a significant amount of pressure pushing down into the abdomen. The picture we end up getting looks similar to this, where we have, first we have liver, this grainy appearance. We have a bright white diaphragm. And the very first chamber of the heart that is on the other side of the diaphragm most anteriorly is the right ventricle. Deep to that, the left ventricle, right atrium, left atrium. Another image, a different cardiac function, different patient, but you can see the same structures. In a bit more detail, we have 
the right ventricle and right atrium with the tricuspid valve between. We have the left ventricle, left atrium, and the mitral valve between. And again, the bright white pericardium that circles the heart. There are two layers to the pericardium, and these are normally together, the visceral and the parietal pericardium, without any fluid in between that's visible. When we are evaluating pericardial effusions, the fluid, the two layers of pericardium are separated by fluid, and therefore you have a white, black, white pattern with the two layers separated and the fluid appearing black. From the subcostal approach, we can turn the probe 90 degrees to obtain a view of the inferior vena cava and its longitudinal axis. In this view, we have the indicator, the probe in orientation indicator, oriented north-south. Um, depending on whether you're trained by a cardiologist or an emergency physician, it's either north or south. In fact, it doesn't particularly matter since this is a tubular structure, and either way, you're just trying to get a long axis through the inferior vena cava. So with the marker towards the head or the foot, you will get you will intersect with the inferior vena cava in its longitudinal axis. Remember that the IVC runs slightly to the right of midline. So the IVC, this is a still picture with the heart the right atrium on the right of the screen, the liver, and the inferior vena cava. Again, it depends on which way your probe is oriented as to whether the heart is on the right or the left of the screen. But again, we are primarily focusing on the inferior vena cava at this point. This is the view that it would appear if your probe was oriented in the other direction with the indicator towards the head. What we're looking at when we look at the IVC is not only its absolute diameter, but also the dynamic nature of its collapse on inspiration. There are different reference numbers for this. Uh, you'll find in different publications. Um, some like to round up to two centimeters, and others are more particular. But in general, um, these numbers fit with the idea that the collapsibility of the IVC represents intravascular volume status. If the IVC small with greater than 50% collapse on inspiration generally represents a central venous pressure of 0 to 5. A slightly larger IVC with still a lot of collapse might represent a CVP 5 to 10. An IVC greater than 1.7 and many places say greater than 2 with less than 50% collapse is a CVP in the double digits, low double digits 10 to 15. And an IVC greater than 1.7 with very little collapse would represent a higher CVP of 15 to 20. Greater than 2 centimeters with dilated hepatic veins can represent uh, a CVP in the 20s. Generally, this would also have no collapse on inspiration. It's important to remember that central venous pressure is not necessarily a predictor of response to fluid resuscitation. But on the high end and the low end of the spectrum, we often can extrapolate a lo very low CVP would be likely to respond to fluids, and a very high CVP would be unlikely. They would already be on the flat part of the Starling curve and less likely to increase their cardiac output with an increase in preload. For example, here we have an inferior vena cava that is small and collapsible. On the side of the screen, you have these centimeter marks which give you a scale, but you can see that with respirations, this IVC is almost completely collapsing. This would represent CVP less than 5. And in a hypotensive patient, in the right situation, that patient would be responsive to fluids. We can also place an M-mode line through the inferior vena cava, M-mode again meaning motion mode, and that records everything that runs along that line over several seconds, and you can freeze the picture and measure with your calipers. You can measure when the positive intrathoracic pressure, the IVC is going to be the largest, and with negative intrathoracic pressure or relatively negative, the IVC is going to be the smallest.
In this case, we can look at C, approximately 30% change for an IVC that's greater than 2 centimeters to begin with, and this would represent a CVP of 10 to 15. From the subcostal view, uh, we can also see the IVC sometimes appearing plethoric, and here you can see the sluggish flow through the inferior vena cava. There's minimal respiratory variation, but the hepatic veins are not significantly dilated. So therefore, this is a, a high teens CVP. After looking at the subcostal view and the inferior vena cava, we move to the apex of the heart, and we get a four-chamber view looking up from the apex of the heart into the thorax. The indicator towards the patient's right, and the probe placed approximately where the patient's apex is. And this can vary significantly from patient to patient. Some patients are more lateral, some are more vertical, depending on their other comorbidities. If you can't get a good view from this, uh, this position, then roll the patient on the left side with their left arm up to open up the rib spaces and allow the probe to go between the ribs. Rolling them onto their left side will move the lung out of the way and bring the heart closer to the chest wall. You'll get a picture that looks somewhat like this, and when it shows up on the screen, here is your image. What we're seeing here is the left ventricle and left atrium, right ventricle, right atrium. And the mitral valve opening and closing, as well as the tricuspid valve. Again, this is the apical four chamber view. The indicator dots towards the patient's right, the dot on the screen is towards the patient is towards the right of the screen, so therefore the images on this side of the screen are right side of chambers and this side of the screen are left side of chambers. One can turn the probe from the apical four chamber ninety degrees counterclockwise and focus on the left ventricle without getting the right ventricle in the picture. What this gives us is a picture of the anterior left ventricular wall and the inferior left ventricular wall. The left atrial appendage can also be seen, a, a common place to find blood clots in patients with atrial fibrillation. And the territories corresponding to the car coronary artery distributions can be best appreciated in the anterior inferior views in this particular orientation. After looking at the heart from the apical area, we can move to the parasternum. This is exactly what it sounds like. It's next to the sternum in the, in the rib space with the indicator towards the patient's left hip. This is the only view where the indicator is not towards the patient's right. What we're focusing on here, as you can see, we get a slice through the heart with just a bit of the right ventricular outflow track and mostly focusing on the left ventricular and the left atrial side. Now this is a CT scan, but it is very similar to the picture that you would have on an echo, and I thought very demonstrative of a few points that need to be made. This is the left ventricle, left atrium, right ventricular outflow tract, ascending and descending aorta, and the pleural space behind. The key point to be made about this slide is the descending aorta is a landmark for figuring out whether fluid that is seen in the picture is in the pleural space or in the pericardial space. So the descending aorta um, is the div dividing point. Pericardial fluid will track anterior to the descending aorta, and pleural fluid will be posterior to the descending aorta. And this helps us figure out whether there's pericardial fluid or a pleural fluid. Since the indicator is towards the patient's left hip, then the dot would correspond to left-sided structures. This is why the left ventricle is oriented in this fashion, in this view. Some examples. Now this picture is not the best use of real estate. So there's quite a bit of unused space posterior to the heart, but this is on purpose to be able to show this descending aorta right here. And to be able to show that the pericardium, bright white pericardium, tracks anterior to the descending aorta, and the pleural space is posterior to the descending aorta. Left atrium, left ventricle, aorta, 
aortic valve, aortic outflow tract, and right ventricular outflow tract. This is somewhat normal contractility with a briskly opening mitral valve and the chamber dimensions decreasing with each contraction. Compare that to this view where you have the mitral valve floating open due to poor cardiac output and the chamber dimensions not changing significantly during contraction. You'll notice the descending aorta right here. And there are two pockets of fluid that we can appreciate. One is the pericardial effusion tracking anterior to the descending aorta, and the other is the pleural effusion posterior. It's not surprising that a patient with poor cardiac function might have these accumulations of fluid, and they can be seen. Turning the probe from the parasternal long axis view 90 degrees clockwise, we can intersect the heart in its short axis and slice it as if it's a loaf of bread and see the heart, the left ventricle especially, at several different levels. For example, the papillary muscle level is a cut near the apex of the heart. The mitral valve looks like a fish mouth and the aortic valve is the classic Mercedes sign, assuming a tri, um, a tri leaflet aortic valve. We can also appreciate in this view that this patient has a pericardial effusion with a separation of the two layers of the pericardium with black fluid. From this short axis view, you, the left ventricle should be circular, look like a donut, with a small beret sitting atop. The right ventricle is that beret. If the left ventricle does not appear circular, then it's often representative of a pathology, which we will discuss later. After looking at the heart from the subcostal, apical, and parasternal views, we appreciate the pleura from the mid-axillary lines bilaterally. Here are the indicators towards the patient head, patient's head. And we're looking at this area here, the sulcus. So what we appreciate in this picture is we can see the spleen, the lung, which is somewhat atelectatic, and the black fluid, which represents a pleural effusion. Corresponds with this dot. So in this picture, head would be here and foot would be towards the right of the screen. You'll also notice in this view that because there's pleural fluid, we can see the spine go beyond the diaphragm. These are vertebral body shadows. We wouldn't necessarily see that, we would be unlikely to see that if the lung was aerated without fluid because air would interfere with ultrasound waves reaching this deeply. Now we're going to move on to, from the views to how to perform the fate examination and what we may be looking for and finding. So the number one goal of the fate exam was to exclude obvious pathology such as effusions, valvular diseases, dissections, um, markers of pulmonary embolus, and so forth. For example, you found a patient who you knew nothing about was admitted to you and this is what you found you would obviously have an idea of their cardiac history right from the get-go because of a few findings. One, you can look at the left ventricle and see that we do not have good contraction. We don't have much change in the chamber size. The mitral valve is not opening well. But we can also see this bright, white, very linear, hyper-density, hyper-echoic structure, and that is a pacemaker wire. So if a patient you know nothing about is found down and you see this, you can know that they've had a significant cardiac history in the past. If that same patient is hypotensive and you see this inferior vena cava, you would know that they were hypovolemic. And this is the visceral pericardium against the heart. And this is the parietal pericardium up against the diaphragm, and in between you have a layer of black. The other thing to note is that during diastole, although it's a little hard to see because this heart is tachycardic, during diastole, 
we have the right ventricular diastolic collapse, which is one of the markers of cardiac tamponade. You'll note in some of my pictures that the orientation dot is not on the right side of the screen. Um, some of these pictures were taken at another institution where a cardiologist uh, was the trainer for the bedside sonographers and therefore the orientation of most of the pictures taken at that institution is in the cardiology mode. But at UC Irvine we try to keep the indicator towards the right of the screen to maintain consistency. The picture would look the same because if the dot is to the other side of the screen then we also have the probe turned 180 just to point out why some of these dots are in different positions. Here's another finding of a patient who was profoundly hypotensive. You can see the spinal shadow here and the short axis view of the left of the heart with the heart over on the right side of the chest due to a massive pleural effusion. Valvular dysfunction can be appreciated. This is apical four-chamber view with color Doppler placed across the mitral valve. And during systole, we see a, black, a back jet of blue fluid. And blue means away. Red means toward in terms of Doppler flow. But if we have flow going away from the probe, and recall that the probe is up here on the skin, we have flow going away from the probe, it would appear blue. And during systole, there should be no flow into the left atrium. This represents mitral regurgitation. And by the same token, we have tricuspid regurgitation as well. You can appreciate that this heart has four-chamber dilated cardiomyopathy, and likely that is the, the contributor to the valvular dysfunction. Moving on from obvious pathology, we look at static dimensions of the heart. We are here looking for hypertrophy, chamber enlargements, aneurysms, and just the relative size of the right ventricle to the left ventricle. In this view, the septum is rather thick, and the free wall of the left ventricle is rather thick. This is a qualitative assessment. We're not measuring at this point, although it can be measured. But just compared to a normal heart, this is a thickened, possibly long-standing hypertensive patient. Here's four-chamber dilation, poor function. We're not looking at the function per se, but often we do notice it simultaneously, but all four chambers here are enlarged. The right ventricle is as large as the left ventricle, and therefore that represents moderate right ventricular enlargement. Here we have normal. It's important to recognize normal so that you can recognize when something is abnormal. In this view, we have the left ventricle, right ventricle, which is about two-thirds the size of the left ventricle, left atrium, right atrium. And here is somewhat quite different, and you, what jumps out at you here is the, it looks like it's upside down. However, this is the left ventricle here, and this entire chamber is the left atrium. This is the Right, right ventricle and the right atrium. You'll also notice that this patient has fairly calcified valves that you can't, can't even see opening significantly. On chest x-ray when this patient presented we saw a huge what we thought was pneumonia initially although it was fairly well circumscribed and turned out to be the right atrium. This patient had mitral uh, rheumatic heart disease of the mitral valve and tricuspid valve. A peristernal short axis view, we can appreciate the left ventricle, which is supposed to be circular, not appearing circular, and also the right ventricle, which is supposed to appear as a crescent up top on the left ventricle is not so much a cres crescent as it is more like a top hat. So this is right ventricular enlargement. And because of the enlargement and the pressure volume overload, we see paradoxical septal motion, which is seen when there's right ventricular pressure volume overload. 
when the mitral valve opens here in diastole, the septum should be moving towards the right ventricle. However, it's just the opposite. When you hear someone mention a D-shaped left ventricle, this is what they're referring to. When we're evaluating the wall thickness and chamber dimensions, uh, transthoracic echo is really the only bedside modality we have that can look at this. We can often appreciate this after CT or MR, but the findings on those studies are delayed until the CT is done. So if you want a real-time view of what someone's um, heart looks like, bedside ultrasound is the go-to modality. After looking at static dimensions of the heart, we go on to look at contractility, and in actuality, this is often real-time um, happening at the same time as we're looking at the static dimensions. It's hard to separate. What we endorse is a qualitative judgment of the ventricular function. What we're asking for here is normal, hyperdynamic, mildly reduced, moderately, or severely reduced cardiac function. It's been shown that putting a number, a quantitative number, on ejection fraction is not necessary and that it's very easy to train and very easily duplicated and replicated between observers. Normal cardiac function appears as such with the left ventricle walls thickening coming towards the midline and decreasing the chamber size with each contraction. The right ventricle contracts in a different fashion because of the different orientation of the fibers and we see instead this tricuspid annulus on the free wall attachment moving towards the apex with each contraction. In comparison, a moderately reduced left ventricular function would thicken and come towards the midline, but the decrease in the chamber dimension size would be significantly less. And severely reduced essentially doesn't thicken or come into the midline that much at all, but rather oscillates in some fashion. We can also see a hyperkinetic function, which is often seen in a vasodilatory state or a hypovolemic state, with the papillary muscles essentially kissing with each contraction. Here's an example of a mildly reduced, moderately reduced, and severely reduced function. It's good to just look at these so that you can recognize. Again, it's a qualitative assessment important to understand what normal looks like so that you can understand when you have something that's either above normal or below normal. Again, here's the normal with the left ventricular walls thickening coming towards the midline and the chamber dimension decreasing with each systolic contraction and the tricuspid annulus squeezing nicely towards the right apex. The right ventricle is two-thirds the size of the left ventricle and the valves are opening nicely. Moving on to the fourth goal of the FATE exam, which is to image the pleura bilaterally. Here we have an image of pleural fluid that is actually loculated. And this is, helps therape therapeutic decisions in real time, say that you're getting ready to place the chest tube in this patient, then you would know that you might run into loculations, might need to break up those loculations on placement of the chest tube, and that a regular thoracentesis or pigtail catheter might not be adequate. If you know this up front, you can get the right tube to the right patient at the right time. Here, with a dot towards the patient's head, we see the diaphragm, the liver, the kidney, and Morrison's pouch. And as the patient breathes, the diaphragm is moving down, and you get a glimpse on the other side of the diaphragm that there's something black. If there were no fluid on the other side of the diaphragm, you would see a mirror image of the liver on the other side of the diaphragm due to a mirror image artifact created by uh, reflection of ultrasound waves from the air in the lungs. If the air, though, is, is moved out of the way due to fluid, you can see the black on the other side, and you lose the mirror image artifact. Now this is the apical two-chamber view with the anterior and inferior walls of the heart and the descending aorta, mitral valve, but you can appreciate here that posterior we have a large pleural effusion.
This is in the abdominal mode, so the, the frame rate is somewhat slower. I'm really looking at the kidney, spleen, and here you can you can see this mirror image artifact that I was discussing before. You do not see the black on the other side of the diaphragm. It looks like you have spleen on the other side of the diaphragm. You lose the vertebral shadow at the diaphragm because of diffusion of the ultrasound waves through the air of the lung. The fifth goal of FATE is to relate the findings to the clinical context, so we'll go through a few cases to de demonstrate how we can apply the FATE exam to our patients. It's important to try to complete the FATE protocol even if you think you've answered your initial question because recall that 30% of uh, FATE exams found things that were relevant to the patient's care that were unexpected. So you may think you've answered your question, but unless you're completely a thorough, you may miss something significant. First case, a 42-year-old woman with H1N1 respiratory failure and severe hypoxemic uh, respiratory failure develops hemodynamic instability. So this was the middle of the night, as it usually is, and this patient who was already hypoxemic developed uh, hypotension tachycardia, and she was very unstable and unable to go down to the CT scanner for an evaluation, and really very difficult to even move for a chest x-ray. So she was in shock, and we were trying to figure out what kind of shock, and it could have been any number of things. So a bedside ultrasound reveals an apical four-chain review of her heart that looked like this. First off, we notice that the right ventricle is large compared to the left ventricle. We also note that the apex is very active, but the right ventricular free wall is somewhat blown out and akinetic. This is classic for McConnell sign, which is fairly sensitive and specific for our PE. So PE was suspected, and the patient was, again, not able to go down to the CT scanner to confirm. So instead, Ultrasound compression of her femoral vein revealed with compression, which is happening during this video, although it's not obvious, there was no uh, collapse of the femoral vein. If the front wall of the vein does not coapt and touch the back wall of the vein, then we assume and uh, treat as if there is something in the vein. And in this case, it was a deep venous thrombosis. So without having to move this patient, we knew what to do, and she was placed on heparin and given an IVC filter the next day. Case number two. We have a man with congestive heart failure with a poor EF known who comes in with C. diff colitis from a nursing home. He's hypotensive and uh, short of breath, and the ER has bolus two liters of fluid for the hypotension, assuming that he's hypotensive hypotensive from hypovolemia. He has had no improvement in his mean arterial pressure, and so you're called to ask on your way down how much more fluid you want us to hang. Well, if you don't know for sure whether you're dealing with hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, or other, then it's best to take a look first before you make that decision. In this case, we see the poor cardiac output, poor cardiac function that we've described previously and an inferior vena cava that is quite full after the two liters of fluid. Also, in scanning the patient's chest, their shortness of breath was pulmonary edema. What we see here are beelines, which are these common tail artifacts going all the way to the edge of the screen, which represent, uh, are the ultrasound equivalent of curly beelines. So the answer on this patient, how much more fluid should I give, no more fluids would be appropriate. This patient is actually in cardiogenic shock. And lastly, it's often, com it's often seen that older patients who've had long-standing hypertension who develop rapid atrial fibrillation come in short of breath. And often the correct thing to do for them is to give them Lasix. In this situation, the patient was given amiodarone and Lasix, but her respiratory distress got worse, and it wasn't clear what was happening until the ultrasound revealed a few things. 
First we had a very thick proximal septum and a small chamber. And this is a, this video is slowed down half time because it was tachycardic and these things can be difficult to appreciate in tachycardia. From another view, we see that the mitral valve is opening and touching that proximally hypertrophied septum and during the beginning of systole is actually stuck to the septum, which would create a situation where mitral regurgitation would occur. Um, if the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is touching the septum, then during systole the fluid is going to go the path of least resistance, in which ca in this case is into the left atrium. So the pulmonary edema that was appreciated, which initially was thought to be in need of Lasix, was actually due to mitral regurgitation because the patient was very hypovolemic, and that could be seen on the inferior vena cava evaluation. So instead of Lasix, this patient was given a different therapy, which improved her resp uh, respiratory status. And that therapy was two liters of fluid and beta blockers. So in summary, the FATE protocol focus assess transthoracic echo. We can do it. It's fairly easy to, to learn. We really should do it to benefit our patients and make decisions in real time about which therapeutic path they should be on. And we will be doing it as we train um, additional physicians and students to perform these tests, which can greatly benefit our patients and improve their outcomes. And your practice will change.